Hello, everybody. Uh, we could gather ourselves. Hopefully, everyone had a good lunch. We're not. We're not running. The presentation is shifting to a back to physical evidence direction a little bit, and our next two presenters are rare breeds within the Kennedy assassination community, which are bona fide, certified experts and professionals in the scientific field who are taking on uh, the case. Many amateurs, and I don't want to mean that in any denigrating way, have gone a long way in analyzing evidence and, and such like that, but we often don't get the same kind of, and I have this, know this from experience, the same kind of cachet in the real world, unless there are also professionals who kind of sign on to the same arguments. And in this case, we have two people who are increasingly starting to work together, and their focus is on the headshot. Um, it's going to be um, first Paul Chambers and then uh, Sherry Gutierrez, who we're all familiar with. Paul um, is a scientist who works with NASA and uh, naval research and his focus is on detonation physics and his expertise is in physics and he wrote a book, The Physics of the Headshot or The Headshot, uh, that goes into quite a bit of depth on his own analysis of the Zapruder film and the physics and timing of the shots and I know he's, a, even since his book has come out, he's refined it and revised his theory to some extent and he's going to share with you additional information and additional insights he has about the headshot. So, without further ado, Mr. Chambers. Thank you. Well, headshot was the most provocative title I could possibly think of. And Lamar Walton told me that he was reading this on the plane and he was so afraid he took the cover off lest the sewer to see it and get the wrong idea. Um, the people of Prometheus could not improve on this, but they tried hard. Um, I, I felt I, I, I wanted to call it this because the headshot really, I think, is the key to resolving what happened to Kennedy. If you can figure out the physics or science of that, which is my background, you have a handle on, on the truth because there's been so many, uh, so many different versions of what happened over the years. Uh, the only way I know to get to the bottom of something is, is to use science. Headshot is not a long book. <coughs> And the reason is, the truth can almost always be told succinctly. If I want to trick you, fool you, or bamboozle you, then I'm going to write a thousand pages. Like some of the fellow I know, Vincent Bugliosi, which who is actually the motivation for this book. Uh, I got a copy of his book and started reading, having been always interested in the assassination. And his book is about 2,000 pages long if you take into account the footnotes and everything else he's got. But uh, I'm a lazy guy. I don't want to read 2,000 pages if I don't have to. So I jumped to the section that talked about the science, what is going on, what actually happens when the shots hit and so forth. And I found some very interesting things in his book, and I wanted to uh, put them out here for you. One is called uh, what I call bad science. First is small objects cannot push large objects because they're too small. Now, it's not the size of objects that's necessarily important. It has to do with the momentum of objects. How fast is it moving? So when the asteroid came and wiped out the dinosaurs, it's actually a very small thing compared to the Earth. But nevertheless, it came in with such velocity that it, it wiped out the biosphere. There's a show on Discovery Channel called Bad Science, and, uh, or, or Bad Universe. And Bad Universe did a simulation of this where they had a giant spherical uh, asteroid, a simulant of the asteroid, was huge, it was made out of silicate, very heavy. And they took a pea-sized object to simulate the asteroid, and they sent it down a uh, three-stage gun, which, which shoots it out there about three kilometers a second, and it hits this thing, and you can see on the high speed count, it rocks it backwards. You wouldn't think it possibly a pea-sized thing to move it, but it does. And the whole thing is to, the velocity is going, that is, the momentum. So Mr. Bulosi uh, is wrong about that. And the next thing I didn't know was that, I'm going to get this figured out sooner or later. That um, soft tissue can direct the path of a bullet through high angle deflections. 
Now, I did not know this until I read Mr. Gruber Wilson's book. And the other gem in there was it's very hard to push a child to a swing because you have to push it against the full force of gravity. I also did not know that until I read his book. <laughs> and I know from personal experience I can't lift my daughter up that easily, but I can very easily push her on the swing. And the reason for that is that the tension and the ropes of the swing are actually holding the child and balancing the force of gravity. So the tension in the ropes actually uh, completely counteract the force of gravity, so the child just sits there. So all I have to do is push horizontally. It's very easy to push, push the child. And, but I couldn't understand any of this until I read, finally on page 488, Vincent Bulez, who says, I had avoided taking physics in high school. <laughs> <laughs> then I dawned on me. Okay, now I know what's going on here. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, I think Tom Hanks has got a miniseries coming out in a couple of years, and he's based it on this book. You know, Tom Hanks is an interesting guy. He, he uh, was a math and science guy in high school, and he wanted to go to NASA and be an astronaut, and he ended up doing the movie Apollo 13, which is really fantastic. And now he's following around a guy who avoided taking physics in high school. And uh, I don't know if this is the beginning of the apocalypse or the dumbing down of America or what it is, but not to worry, I sent Mr. Hanks a copy of my book. <laughs> and what did he say? I never heard back from him, but I, I, he, uh, he had tears to me. Now I'll tell you about some good science. Uh, in 1962-3, during the time of Kennedy's administration, Richard Feynman, who's a very famous Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, tried a little experiment at Caltech where he tried teaching the freshman and sophomore classes there uh, some elementary physics. And these uh, were written into books and they became very, very famous called Feynman's Lectures on Kinetics. Carl Sagan says that uh, volume one of this is the best uh, book on science ever written for a layman. But in there he tells you the very principles of, uh, the first is momentum conservation. That means that the momentum of the system, that is the mass times velocity of the initial system, we'll call that MV, so your bullet's moving along, has to equal the final momentum of the system. So if the bullet encounters something, it's going to uh, have to move that mass, but the velocity of that mass will depend. <laughs> If you multiply the, moment, the mass times the velocity, the momentum will be conserved. I mean, it, it doesn't change. If no outside forces act, the momentum of the initial system has to be the same as the momentum of the final system. And now, because of the MV, you're taking into account the fact that there's a velocity to the object. It's not just little m versus big M. It's little b and big b are incorporated there, too. I've got some vectors. These are momentum is usually uh, represented by a vector, which is an arrow. And the arrow, the key to this is to understand the length of the arrow represents the amount of momentum, the magnitude of momentum. But it also, because it's an arrow with a little pointy thing there, it has a direction to it. This is key to understand. Momentum is a vector, which means it has a magnitude and a direction. This is the key to resolving the Kennedy assessment. And the correct explanation of the swing is that, again, the tension of the ropes counter for, uh, balance the force of gravity, so I'm just, I just have to accelerate the mass. So a little bit of force will actually move the child along because I'm just pushing against MA. I don't have to worry about gravity involved. Uh, the other law that's relevant here is called um, energy conservation. In this case, there are many different kinds of energies. The two that are salient are the kinetic energy, which is given by 1 half mv squared, square velocity, and the um, the height of the object gives it a potential energy, and that's given by mgh. G is the uh, acceleration of gravity sea level, which is 32 feet per second per second. H is just the height of the object. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, these are the relevant laws here. Not too bad. It's about you know basic algebra and some very simple <coughs> freshman physics. But this is what you need to understand this. In '63, uh, Feynman said the reason he did these lectures was because physics was part of the modern culture. That was 50 years ago. So if he was right then, he's really right today, because our world depends on physics constantly. GPS devices, uh, cell phones, cable television, your fiber optic uh, uh, television, computers, everything depends on physics. None of that would work if someone hadn't figured out the right laws of physics. It's all based on quantum mechanics and, and uh, light propagation and other things. None of that stuff would work. Okay. All right. Um, the first thing I had to look at when I started my book was to look at the Warren Commission. And um, one of the things that they concluded was that although it wasn't necessarily the findings, uh, 
they thought the, the, the bullet was shot and hit Governor Connolly. It's very persuasive evidence to indicate the same bullet which penetrated the president's throat also caused Governor Connolly's wounds. However, not everybody agreed with that because Governor Connolly himself thought they were hit by separate bullets. His wife thought they were hit by separate bullets. There were other issues involved. So some of the commission members didn't, didn't quite agree with that theory, but nevertheless, they say, that's okay. We all think that on the basis of the evidence, Oswald acted alone. Well, the sad thing of this, if you look at, look at the film, first of all, Oswald is constrained by three shots, and there's only three casings found in the school board depository. And if you look at the timing of the Zabruder film, which I think is the best known extant record of the assassination, and you match up the timing of the shots in that film, it's very difficult to get off more than three shots in the time frame that's involved. So a fourth shot caused an enormous amount of problems for the commission from a number of perspectives. Um, and when they found that uh, one of the bullets ricocheted hit the street and uh, injured an innocent bystander, James Tate, that meant that one bullet has got to account for seven wounds. It's got to account for Kennedy's throat wound, his back wound, Connolly's wounds, front, back, wrist wounds, and in the leg. That's a lot of wounds for one bullet. But if, if the alternative is two bullets and you know there's a final shot that hits Kennedy in the hands, that's four shots. Four shots is a big problem. Four shots means multiple shooters. So this conclusion makes no sense if there's a fourth shot. And yet they're saying, we're going to agree with the single bullet theory. Yeah. Single bullet theory has got to be true for this to hold true. So what does, what does the commission do? Basically, they publish the Epimenides paradox. The statement below is true, the statement above is false. Anytime you see a logical <laughs> conundrum or a logical inconsistency, you know you're being fooled, and you're being deliberately fooled by somebody. So the government doesn't lie, it disinforms. This is the hallmark of disinformation. Two mutually exclusive, mutually contradictory statements. And that's all you have to read in the entire 26 volumes of the Warren Commission to know you're being fooled, and you're being deliberately tricked. That's all you have to read. Vince Bullius says, I'm going to prove to you that you don't know what you're talking about. Everybody raise your hand and tell me if you've read a conspiracy book, and everybody's hand goes up. Now, raise your hand if you've read the Warren Commission report. How many people have read the entire Warren Commission report at the bottom? Mm -hmm. You say, see, you haven't, you haven't looked at both sides. And I can tell you, no matter how thin you make your pancakes, they always got two sides. Well, that's how quick you have to look at the Warren Commission report. All you have to do is look at the conclusions, and you know it's wrong. So let's move on from that. All right, why did the commission fail? Well, its first problem was it had a duality of purpose. The initial purpose was to investigate what happened to President Kennedy. But the underlying reason why people are joining the commission is because they want to prevent World War III. Or the word that America is going to be thought of as a banana republic. The president can be shot out under a nose and we're a banana republic, especially if the investigation turns back to our own government or something terrible like that. So they're trying to save America's reputation. Johnson's twisting people's arm. Uh, Warren himself doesn't want to join until Johnson tells them, well, the first people of strike is going to kill 40 million people. And he says, well, you know, this president is that serious. I'll join. So immediately, right off the gate, right out of the gate, they've got a different reason for joining the commission than fact-finding. So that's wonderful, and Edward Epstein says, if those two goals line up, you're in good shape. But if there becomes a conflict between them, one of those goals is going to become dominant. The second problem was there's no diversity of background in the Warren Commission. Everybody's a lawyer. That means everybody's stuck in one paradigm. And the lawyer really paradigm that operated in this case was two things. One, the body is prima facie evidence. That means it supersedes all our evidence. Whatever the body says, that's what happened. I'm going to ignore everything else. I don't care what it is. That's the first paradigm. The second was science doesn't matter because A, we don't understand it, but B, the truth is what you can prove to a jury. And if I put a scientist up and he says, my God, there's conservation momentum in this case, or don't worry, I've got another scientist, and I'll put him up there, and he'll say, no, it's Jenny, it's high school Jenny. The work is right. It, it, his head recalls because of Jenny. And those two guys will wash each other out in front of the jury. Usually the people who get on the jury are people who are too dumb to figure out how to get off jury duty. <laughs> so they can't digest that information. So what do they do? They, they guard. If juries worked getting at the truth, NASA would be using them to design the space shuttle. I guarantee it. But they don't. All right. The next problem they have is they base their model on corrupted data. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and the last problem, even more serious, is they alter the data. 
Gerald Ford alter, altered the autopsy data from an entrance wound in the back to a wound in the neck. That's the only way to make a single wall theory. If it hits him in the back, it's coming at his chest. So it's got him hit him in the neck to come at his throat. So he alters the wound. In 1997, the Assassination Record Review Board uh, caught, caught him on that, and he admitted to it, well, I moved the wound, he says, for clarification. Well, I guarantee you, there are two absolute ways to get the wrong answer. One is, base your model on corrupted data <coughs> or alter the data. You will, every time, get the wrong answer, I promise you. That's the end of the war, as far as I'm concerned. Now, how does science find the truth? This is the whole bench and the whole reason for my book is to say, let's cut through this lawyerly clutter and the nonsense that's been out there, let's look at it scientifically. How would we do that? Okay. Well, the first thing that is important to understand is, how does science go bad? When are things going bad? And the, the worst example, possibly, is called Piltdown Man. And for many people who aren't familiar with Piltdown Man, this was the major scientific hoax of the 20th century. Uh, this fellow, Dawson, Charles Dawson, was an amateur paleontologist. He, in 1909, he seeded some gravel pit beds with some fake fossils the most egregious of which was built down there. He took the skull of a human, that was a few hundred years old, and the jawbone of an orangutan, and he put them together, and he filed down the jawbone so you couldn't see where they were up, and he filed down the teeth, and he stained them, he did a really good job. And he probably had help from this uh, young student named Pierre Talliard, Duchardin, who was very, became very, very famous. And Stephen Gould thinks that Chardin did this as a student prank. And then all of a sudden, people believed it, and took it so seriously, he couldn't blow the prank. He couldn't laugh at anybody anymore because it was all the newspapers and it had blown up and would destroy his career. So he kept silent for like 70 years about this, but that's another really part of the story. This was so convincing that the entire scientific community and the anthropological community, largely around the people of Britain, were so happy to get a fossil in Britain that looked of some kind of antiquity compared to, the, there were great fossils of Neanderthal man in Germany, but the Germans and the French had the good stuff. The English did not, now we had a great fossil that was even more primitive than anything anybody else had. They were deliriously happy. Plus it fit into their models of human evolution. We think the brain should evolve first and then everything else, the jawbone and the tissue. So they fell for this hook line and sinker. When the real fossils came to light in the 20s and 30s by Raymond Dart and Tom Skull, the scientific community dismissed it. Dart's a fraud. He's faked his fossil. <laughs> They didn't believe Dart, and Dart had the time skull, which was the real fossil, small brain, modern dentition. Um, and it wasn't until years later when more and more of these fossils came like But in the 40s, there were so many of these fossils, it was clear that Piltdown Man was an outlier. And the only way you could make sense of all the data, because all the data is down here, Piltdown Man's up here somewhere, is to just throw that out. It's clear it was an outlier. It wasn't until the 1950s, you look at 40 years to figure this thing out, that they started to do radiocarbon dating and uh, actually examine the original fossils, and they found that he had filed down the stuff and put these complicated stains on. Very sophisticated thing, but it was a total portrait. Uh, they did radiocarbon dating. Instead of 100,000 years old or 2 million years old, like people first thought, it was a hundred, couple hundred years old. These were not a company activity. Well, the moral of the story is two things. One is, in science, you go back and apply new methods to old data. That's one way you get to the truth. The second key thing is that you can't ever in science go by eyewitness testimony alone. It doesn't have meaning in science for this reason. Because the greatest scientists of the day looked at Piltdown Man and anointed it and blessed it as, as a great fossil. This was the fossil of Rosetta Stone that was going to tell us everything we need to know about human evolution. The best scientists of the day fell hook, line, and sinker for it. So if, if science said, well, we're going to accept that without the evidence, without physical evidence, you never get it out. You never get it fixed. That would still be playing us today. But because science demands something more, physical evidence, or a reproducible experiment, you can always go back and redo the experiment or look at the physical evidence and get to the truth. This is very important. All right, the second way science gets at the truth is to fit models to data, not data to models. This is what the Warren Commission did. They fit their data to a model. The model was Oswald shot Kennedy. Every piece of data is going to go into that model. No matter how we have to force it in there, we'll do 10 single bullet theory. It doesn't matter. We'll jump through a million hoops. But by God, Oswald shot Kennedy. This is being a data to model. Wrong answer. Fit models to data. Always go by the data. Fit your model to the data. And the wonderful example of this in the history of science is given by Kepler and Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe, I'm belaboring this for a reason. Uh, and actually, when I first sent my book out for publishers, they would write back and say, There's too much Tycho Brahe here. I can't publish that. 
I'm going to go all like that. Finally, I found someone who had a more open mind than she But uh, Tycho Brahe was this uh, very famous, rich, uh, wealthy um, aristocrat. And he had his own uh, island, the Island of Sven. He bought these very sophisticated instruments to measure the heavens. Of the he did the most sophisticated naked eye measurements ever. I don't think they've been rivaled to today. It's so like 1500 or something. And it was beautiful, exquisite data. Now, this little fellow, Kepler, was a young guy, and he had this interesting model where he looked at the perfect solids of the Greeks, the sphere, the, uh, the cube, the uh, prisms, and things. He, he took these uh, the perfect rectangular solids, icosahedron, put them together in this model to model the solar system. Because at that time, only five planets were known. And this was working perfectly. But he couldn't get it to work out really, really well. But he's so impressed, Tycho Brahe, that Brahe invited him to his laboratory to spend. Well, there are a little bit of a tussle when he his data. Uh, on his deathbed, Brahe bequeaths him the data and says, don't let me have died in vain. That's what he says in death row. Well, Kepler going to immortalize Brahe. Kepler takes Brahe's data, and he tries to fit it to a model. The Greek model was these perfect crystalline spheres of everything moving around in the heavens. And he, he just can't make things work out. The orbit of Mars, he's getting a good agreement, but a couple of these points are way, way off, and he just knows Brian's data is too good. Brian can't be wrong, so he, he pushes himself and he comes up with the right answer, which is the ellipse. And that's a, an oval, a, a oval shape with two foci. So the planet, actually the sun's at one foci, so the, the sun sort of goes a little bit farther away here and a little closer to the other side. This is the right model. But only because he persisted did he get this model. And, and Isaac Newton comes along years later, 50 years later, and plugs this into, and he invents calculus, which is a huge invention. He plugs in Kepler's elliptical orbits, and by God, the inverse force law falls out. That's what makes the uh, apple fall down and hit the Earth. Newton figured out exactly what the law was. It's an inverse squared law. It's uh, proportional to the mass of the object, and the gravitational constant, and the inverse distance between the centers of the objects. That's the right law. And he gets it from Kepler, plugging it into these calculus. This is a huge, major turning point in history of science. Someone who proved something mathematically. It's just a, Procipia is just a major change that turned everything from doing astrology to doing modern science. As